began um, on last time is talking about Israel being divided, understanding. Now, that, uh, again, just kind of going back to touch on the name of the topic um, of this teaching is make us one, make us one. And so we began by looking at why we're not one, why we're not one, and what happened to create this, this division in a people, in, 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 in a nation, um, in a, a family that has been divided. And so we began by looking at um, how the division, the idea of division was put in place by bringing in disobedience. And we looked at the first place that it happened, which was where? In the garden. And what happened there? The enemy went to Hava, and he introduced the idea, he introduced the idea of what? Disobedience. This is what separated. He went in between Adam and Hava, and he introduced the idea of disobedience. And as a result, there came separation. All manners of separation and division. What were some things that were divided and separated? Adam and Hava came in between them right away. Now, Adam, you, by the sweat of your brow, Hava, you, the, uh, in childbearing, pain. And even if you go into, you know, some of the other writings, the book of Adam and Eve, it'll talk about how they literally separated and went different places as they were in mourning over the fall and over what had been done. What were some other things that we can see represented in, um, in that, in a separation taking place? They were separated from the Most High. Right? There was a separation. There was a separation. Adam, where you at? Where you at? What else? What else? Huh? As a whole, Israel, but in the garden. In the land. That's right. So what happened? He cast them out of the land and put guards at the beginning. That land had everything they needed. That was their home. That was their place of refuge that was their place of provision that was their place of protection all of it was there in the garden he separated them from it so the separation and division happened on so many levels there and then we talked about the warning that the most high gave us when he gave his commands the warning that he gave was don't do anything like the nations. Don't listen to them. Don't check out their high places. Matter of fact, tear them down. Don't ask how they worship their gods. Don't deal with it. Why not? Because you'll begin to incorporate that into my worship. Next thing you know, you're where? Over there. You started out pitching your tent toward the place, <laughs> Lot. And where did you end up? In the gates. And that don't mean, y'all, when they say in the gates, they don't mean, oh, well, you know, he was just right there at the entrance. No, 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 no. The gates is the governing body of the land. He was one of the rulers of the land. So he didn't just get in the land. He moved up and ascended to leadership in that place. So the Most High knew that there was something coming if we would open ourselves up. Don't open yourselves up because here's what's going to happen as a result. And so we have gone through also the beginning of the separation. We went to Shalomo. We went to Solomon. And what did we identify when we got to Solomon? That he was told... He was told 
don't bring this stuff in here. What did he do? He started entertaining all of these women, all of these women, bringing in their gods. And at the beginning, it was just, oh, yeah, well, put, you know, you can put yours over there. Oh, yeah, you can put yours over there. Oh, yeah. And what did it say they did? They turned his heart away from the Most High. That's what did. That's what they did. Yahweh loved David, and he loved Solomon. He told Solomon something. He said, walk before me perfect as your father did. But Shalomo decided that he, in the wisdom that he was blessed with, was so wise that he could handle it. He couldn't. He couldn't. And so what ends up happening is now a promise is made. And a man that he himself picked, handpicked, from the northern tribes by the name of Yerob Am. He made him one of his rulers, and that's what you typically hear as Jeroboam. He made him one of his rulers, and eventually that man was given a promise. And remember the prophet came to him and said, here are ten pieces. These ten pieces represent these tribes that are going to be given into your hand. That was the northern tribes. And remember when we did that, we, sh we, we showed how when they were dividing up land inheritance that they would take out Levi and they would take out Joseph and they would add in Manasseh and they would add in Ephraim, right? And so that's where we're at. That's where we're at. We see where um, Europe um, has now um, gone to the, uh, the king of the southern tribes, and that is, um, uh, his name is Rehab Am, or Rehab. It's, it's really a kit in there. <laughs> so it's Rehab Am. And so now he is the son. That Rehab Am is the son of Shalomo, or Solomon. And he has now said in his self, you know what? I'm going to be harder on y'all than even my father was. And the first thing that happens, he sends somebody to go collect. And what did they do? Stoned them. Killed them. So now, this means war. You now have a people that's divided. And remember, the northern kingdom is now divided from the southern kingdom. They are now at war. All right? So that's kind of where we ended. We're going to pick up. Now let's go to uh, the 13th chapter. No, we got to get to the end of the 12th chapter. So let's go to 1 Kings. Uh, let's go to 1 Kings. And we're going to go to chapter 12. We've covered most of the chapter already, so we're going to go down to the end. There's something, something significant that we need to see that's happening here in this division. Remember, what starts this process of division? The introduction of what? Disobedience disobedience. Bring in disobedience and you can separate and divide. So as we look now, let's look at verse, start at verse 27. Sorry, chapter 12. First Kings chapter 12. We'll start at verse 27. And now remember, we got to keep track Remember that Yarab Am is the northern tribes, okay? So he's the ten. Yarab Am is the northern tribe. Uh, Rehab Am is the southern tribe. That's the two. 
the 10 in the north, the 2 in the south, all right? The south is where Yerushalayim is. That is where Jerusalem is. That is where the capital is. And what else, what else is there that is of extreme importance? The temple. That is where the temple that Solomon built is at, okay? The temple that Solomon built is in the south. It's in the southern tribe. So this is the place where they go when they make Aliyah, when they go up for those feast days, when they now pay any, any um, uh, offerings and sacrifices that are made are made there. Their, 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 uh, their taxes are paid there. All of that takes place there. All right? Important to recognize. So now let's see. Y'all remember, they, they're at odds, right? Because the, the southern king says to the northern king, I'm going to treat you worse than my dad did. He says, uh, the, the, amount of, the, the amount of pressure you'll get from us is not even equivalent to what you got from my dad. He says, I, I, there's more to me in, in my pinky finger <laughs> than in my dad's whole waist. <laughs> That's what he said, you know? And so, yeah, he was, he was gangster, man. He was not playing no games. All right, so let's take a look. Let's start at 27, and let's see what's happening. And it says, if these people go up to do slaughterings in the house of Yahweh at Yerushalayim, then the heart of this people shall turn back to their master, Rehob Am, sovereign of Yehuda, and they shall kill me. And the me is Yarab Am. Or Jeroboam. That's the northern king. We got to keep those separate, okay? And they shall kill me and go back to Rahab, um, sovereign of Yehuda, because they're divided, right? Because they're divided, they're split. The king of the north is saying, I don't want to send my people to the south because if I do, they're going to regather their allegiance to him. And then they'll kill me. Verse 28 says, So the sovereign took counsel and made two golden calves <laughs> and said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem." Now wait a minute. Didn't the Most High say, You shall come to the place where I have caused my name to be? And this is the place? All right. I'm going to take one second to pause and, 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 and pull on your memory on some scripture because we need to remember that this happened. All right, so we're right in the middle of 28. Before we go any further, do you remember when the children of Israel were coming out of the wilderness and remember when they were going into the land, there were two and a half tribes who stayed on the other side of the Jordan, right? Now, remember the conversation that they had, and remember that they had to literally send Joshua. Joshua went over there to prevent a war. What was that war over? They created a slaughter place as a replica to that which was going to be in the land. That which was going to be in Jerusalem, They created a replica. Now they had a reason. And they had to quickly explain their reason before the other heads got there. Because they were coming to fight. They wasn't coming to talk. They were coming to fight. But what happened was they explained and what they said was we are building this so that when your sons say to our sons, you have no inheritance with us, then they can look at this and they can know. Why? Because we know that over time, generations forget. And then all of a sudden, it's like we go from family to who is you. And that's what they wanted to prevent. They didn't want to hit the who is you stage. So what they did 
was they built this replica to help solidify, hey, we people. You know how we know that we people? Because you got the same thing that I got, and, it was, and it's been there the same amount of time. So this, we know, it's proof. That's important to recognize, because they were coming to make war. But there was a promise that those two and a half tribes gave. They said, we're not going to do what? Make any slaughterings. We're not going to give any sacrifices there. We're only doing this so y'all know, we know, our children know, your children know that we family. All right? So that's important to recognize. Now let's continue. <clears throat> First Kings chapter 12, 28. And it says, see your mighty ones. And this is after he done built the golden calf. And he done told them, two of them this time, he done built two. And he says, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. You ain't got to do all that. See your mighty ones, O Israel, which brought you from the land of Mitzrayim. And he set up one in Bethel, and, other, and the other he put in Dan. So he went to Bethel and set up one in the north. And he went to Dan and set up another in the north. And verse 30 says, And this matter became a sin, for the people went before the one as far as Dan. In other words, they were going to both of these. And they're like, oh, pick your location. Let me make this nice and convenient for you. This became sin. Verse 31, and he made the house of high places and made priests of all sorts of people who were not the sons of Levi. And Yorob Am performed a festival on the 15th day of the, get this, 8th. New moon. Like the festival that was in Yehuda. And he offered on the slaughter place. So he did at Bethel slaughtering to the calves that he had made. And at Bethel he appointed the priest of the high places which he made. Let me back up. The 15th day. The eighth new moon, like the festival. What festival are they talking about? What festival is it like? What festival is it like? It's like Tabernacles. It's like Sukkot. Because when is Sukkot? The seventh new moon, the 15th day. The 15th day of the seventh new moon is Sukkot. That's the beginning of Sukkot. That's the first day of Sukkot. And he made a festival like it. So not only did he build a golden calf, not only did he build a slaughter place, not only did he appoint priests of anybody, not only did he put one location-wise so they can easily get to it in Bethel and in Dan, but then he made a fake Sukkot a month later. And he told them, you ain't got to go all the way over there to do that. You can stay right here and do this. That's what he told them. It became sin to them. It became sin to them. Verse 33 and he made offerings on the slaughter place which he had made. You ain't supposed to do that. And he made offerings on the slaughter place which he had made at Bethel on the 15th day of the eighth new moon in the new moon which he had devised where? In his own heart. Did the Most High tell him that this was a set-apart time? No. He devised this in his own heart. And he performed a festival for the children of Israel and offered on the slaughter place and burned incense. This is what he did. This is what he did. And so here you have 
this king of Israel. This is a king of Israel. And he's the king of the northern tribe. The largest is ten tribes. Separation. Disobedience. Disobedience. So let's continue. We're going to take a look now. Let's go to chapter 13. We'll start at verse 4 because you, you have an idea of what's going on. You have an idea of what's going on. Um, I want to point out something real quick before I go any further, which is the name of Rahab Am means people will enlarge. People will enlarge. That is the southern king. Rahab Am means people, Am meaning people. People will enlarge. Okay? Then Yarab Am, which is the king of the north, his name means a people will contend. Still the arm, so still the people. <laughs> Y'all hear that? This still the people. Both of them are the people. Rahab arm, the people, will enlarge. Yarab arm, the people, will contend. Keep that in mind. And so this guy changed the holy days, added all kind of stuff in, decided to put something in its place, made which is clean, unclean. And so let's go to verse 4. Let's read verses 4 through 8. Let's read verses 4 through 8. First Kings chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. And it says, and it came to be when sovereign uh, Yarab um, heard the sayings of the man of Elohim who cried out against the slaughter place in Bethel, that he reached out his hand from the slaughter place saying, seize him. Then his hand, which he stretched out toward him, dried up so that he was unable to bring it back to him. And so, just a little bit, Yahweh sent a prophet to go and to speak at that slaughter place in Bethel and to rebuke it, to rebuke him for what he had done. So, verse 5, this is now the man that he's saying, go seize him. Verse 5, and the slaughter place was split apart, and the ashes poured out of the slaughter place according to the sign which the man of Elohim had given by the word of Yahweh. That, that prophet was told by the Most High that this would be the sign. And to tell that to them, if you think that I'm telling you what saved Yahweh, you will know because this is what's going to happen. And that this was the slaughter place that he built there in Bethel would split. There we go again. Splitting. Dividing, it's showing the representation of disobedience. And so here we are, and it's in the slaughter place. This is the thing that's supposed to be there to worship the Most High in paying uh, and in giving um, of the sacrifices and in providing meat in the house of Yah. And so now let's go to verse... Six, and it says, and the sovereign answered. Now, remember, his arm done dried up, and what did he tell him at first? Seize him. Y'all think he wanted to seize him so he could give him a high five? I think, did he, did, was he going to say, good job, good job? G-O-O-D-J-O-B, good job, good job? Yeah, probably wasn't about to happen. <laughs> but look what happens here. So, verse five. He says, uh, verse 6, sorry. Verse 6 says, And the sovereign answered and said to the man of Elohim, Please appease the face of Yahweh for your, your Elohim and pray for me, that my hand might be restored to me. And the man of Elohim appeased the face of Yah, and the sovereign's hand was restored to him and became as it was before. 
The sovereign then said to the man of Elohim, come home with me and refresh yourself, and I give you a gift. But the man of Elohim said to the sovereign, if you were to give me half your house, I do not go in with you, nor do I eat bread, nor drink water in this place. Not doing it. Now, there is more to this story. Um, this is not the place that I'm teaching from, so I'm not going to go all the way into it. Um, but note that even in this, there was some division because this young prophet was met by an older prophet. Yahweh had already spoken this word to him. Don't eat there. Don't stay there. Don't even come back the same way you went. And the older prophet went to him and said, huh, come stay with me. The young prophet said, well, the most I said I shouldn't. And he was like, ah, he told me you good. Come on. That young prophet did not consort the most high, consult the most high. But instead, he said, oh, okay. And he went in. And as a result, he died a horrible death because of his disobedience. Now, this was the man that came and delivered a word of rebuke to the people that were worshiping in this way in the north. But this was a time of disobedience. And so, again, I'm not going to go too far into that one. Um, and so I want you to understand something that's happening here. Next, we're going to go to, uh, let's stay with the northern kingdom. So let's go to Ezekiel chapter 18. And I want you to understand now what is happening within Israel. Ezekiel chapter 18. Yes, sir. And we're going to go to verse 29. Verse 29, all right? And it says, And the house of Israel have said, listen to this, y'all. Listen to this. And the house of Israel has said, The way of Yahweh is not right. Right. Did y'all hear that? The way of Yahweh is not right. The way of Yahweh is not right. Now, here's the thing. People aren't bold enough to say this directly. Now they cover it up by saying, well, that's not why I do it, or we don't have to do that anymore, or it's the law of Moses, or that's for the Jewish people. Or, so this is all of the ways that basically what you're saying is the way of Yahweh is not right. And he says, are my ways not right, O house of Israel? Is it not your ways that are not right? He's like, wait a minute. Now, who is Israel? When this is addressing Israel, the house of Israel, please note that the northern tribes, that's how they're referred to. And so... When it's now speaking of the house of Israel, you're saying, wait a minute. Yeah, wait, let me get this right. So, you built a whole slaughter place. You built two golden calves. Went and set all of this stuff up in two locations. Took the set-apart time of the Most High and decided in your own heart that you was going to do it on the eighth month, on the 15th day of the month. And you think that the ways of the Most High are not right. Now look what it says in 30. Therefore I judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, declares the Master Yahweh. Repent and turn back from your transgressions and let not crookedness be a stumbling block to you. Let not crookedness be a stumbling block to you. 
cast away from you all the transgressions by which you have transgressed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O Israel? Why should you die? He's saying, listen, I'm telling you what to do. Why should you die? You shouldn't have to die. Why? Because I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, declares the master Yahweh. So turn back and what? Live. Turn back and live. Ezekiel's talking to Israel. Let's go to Hosea chapter 1. And again, we're now we're staying with the northern tribes. We're staying with the northern tribes. Yorab Am has gotten the northern tribes so far off track that they're keeping other holy days and they're serving and bowing down to um, golden images. Verse 6 through 10, verses 6 through 10. Hosea chapter 1, verse 6 through 10. Again, the northern tribes are who we're dealing with. Verse 6 says, And she conceived again and bore a daughter. And he said to him, Call her name lo ru Amah, For no longer do I have compassion on who? The house of Israel, northern tribe, so as to forgive them at all. But I have compassion on the house of who? Yahudah. And save them by Yahweh their Elohim, and not save them by, um, by bow or by so, sword or battle or bow. I said bow. Not save them by bow or by sword or battle, by horses or horsemen. Now remember the split. The house of Israel, who he said he is not having compassion on, is the northern tribe. At this time, he was having compassion on Yehuda. Now, what was Yehuda's problem? When we first go back to the divide and the split, what was the real problem with Yehuda? Like the, the, north, the, the southern tribe, Rahab Am. What did he say to his cousin, Nim? Uh, yo, uh, we're going we to not only do you like my dad did you, I'm going to do you even worse. So now he wasn't telling them they need to worship false gods and stuff, right? He was just being a real jerk. Real mean. He was not treating his brother right. So he needed to learn. Now, understand this. We're in verse uh, 7. Verse 6 speaks of Israel. No compassion. Verse 7 speaks of Yehuda. He says, I will still have compassion. That ain't forever. Neither one of these are forever. The no compassion is not forever. The compassion is not forever. And verse 8 says, And she weaned lo Ruhamah and conceived and bore a son. Then he said, Call his name lo Ami, for you are not my people. And I am not for you. You are not my people and I'm not for you. All right? So this is to a point. You are not my people. I am not for you to a degree. Because verse 10 says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which is not measured nor counted, and it shall be in the place where I was said, where it was said to them, You are not my people, they shall be called. You are sons of the living El. So that no compassion, something took place. Something took place. He said, I won't have any compassion on you now. And he did what? Scattered them. He says, you are not my people. 
He pushed them away. If you look, and I, I don't know, let's see, I don't have this in here, um, but I'm going to, I want to pull this up real quick. Uh, I want to pull this up real quick because this is important. So let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3. Verse, let's start at blah, 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 verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 6. And Yahweh said to me in the days of Yehoshiahu, the sovereign, have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree and there committed whoring. All of this serving of other gods is considered adultery against the Most High. This bowing down, this making golden calves, this recognizing holy days that are days that I found in my heart versus the ones that I found in the Torah. And verse 7 says, And after she had done all these, I said, Return to me. But she did not return. And her treacherous sister Yehuda saw it. Because Yehuda was there, they were still doing what they were supposed to do, just being real mean and jerkish about their brothers and taxing them and all that kind of stuff. But they were at least still keeping the feast days. They were still observing the Shabbat. They were still bringing forth the offerings and the sacrifices as they were commanded to do so. But they saw what their brethren were doing. They took note of it. And it says in verse 8, and I saw that all the uh, and I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and gave her a certificate of divorce. I put her away. The northern tribe he put away. Remember, y'all remember what it said? Lo Ami, what did Lo Ami mean? Not my people. Y'all remember the name of Yorab Am and Rahab Am, right? So the Ami is just Am, me, Am, me. So my people. So they were both the people, right? Remember that? They were both the people. But he said to the northern kingdom, I'm divorcing you. Lo Ami, you are not my people. Lo, no, Ami, my people. You are not my people. And this is what it's showing right here. He said, I gave her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister, Yehuda did not fear, but went and committed whoring too. So we ain't got there yet. But Yehuda turned around and was like, oh. Now, y'all, we've been reading through Jeremiah for the last couple months. This is all it's talking about. This, Jeremiah is preaching and prophesying and speaking to the southern tribe. Ezekiel was talking to the northern tribe. But Jeremiah is going there, and he's saying, hey, stop doing what you're doing, what they're doing. They're throwing the man in jail. They, they, he says, I wish that my whole face was a river. I mean, I'd be able to maybe at that point cry some tears that could make up for how I feel. And the things that are happening, I'm seeing it, and they're coming against him. Just like we see that happen with the, the prophet that came and rebuked um, Yorab Am. And so verse 9 says, And it came to be through, the, through her frivolous whoring that she defiled the land and had committed adultery with stones and wood. And yet for all this her sister 
Her treacherous sister Yehuda has not turned to me with all her heart, but falsely declares Yahweh. And Yahweh said to me, backsliding Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Yehuda. And so here's where you see when you go back into Hosea, let's go back over to Hosea, where you see here that there is something that takes place. This isn't necessarily a short span of time that he's saying that this will happen. But he says, what will eventually happen is you who were not my people will be called the sons of the living El. That's how compassionate he is. He allows it to go out. But I'm going to show you why he allowed it to go out. Verse 11. Verse 11 says, And the children of Yehuda, and the children of Israel, who is the children of Yehuda? Which, north or south? South, right. Who's their king? Rahab Am. That's right. Who is the who are the children of Israel? Northern. And who was their king? Yorab Ham. That's right. And so here you have it. Look at what happens. He says, And the children of Yehuda and the children of Israel shall be gathered together. What happened when they first, and we looked at that time period where Shalomo died, what happened at Shalomo's death? Division. Division. Kingdom divided. One people became divided, ruled by two separate kings, Rahab Am and Yarab Am. And it says, What are they going to do? They're going to be gathered together, and they are going to appoint for themselves one head and shall come up out of the earth. Come up out of the earth. Come up out of the earth. Where have they been scattered? All nations. And it says, for great is the day of Israel. And that Israel is a poetic form used for Yahu souls. Yahu souls. And so this is, matter of fact, we're about to take a little bit of our lesson. And I'm gonna pause, I'm gonna pause here. Um, yeah, this is definitely gonna be maybe four teachings. Not two. Because I ain't I ain't done yet. But I want to take a look at this before we move on. So we just went over the meanings of the letters. We haven't gone over all of them, but you have them all. So if you have your resource Go into group me, you can pull that up, or if you have it printed out. Let's take a look at what these what these letters mean. All right, so the word, can y'all see that? Yeah, it's pretty big. The word for where it says, Great is the day of Israel. This is what we're looking at. All right, so the first letter, and again it means Yah who sows or El sows, God sows. The first letter we're looking at is what? To the right. That's a yod, right? That's a yod. What does that what does that mean? Arm or hand, right? You see that right there? What's the next letter? Zain. Right? Zain. Y'all remember what Zain means? Weapon, yeah, a weapon or a plow. Makes sense. We're talking about sowing, right? That's what it means. So, again, that we know what the word means. And what's the next letter? 
third letter now. Race. We got a race up here. And that race means what? The back of the head. Back of the head or man, man's head. The back of a man's head. Um, so we have so far hand plow back of man's head. I ain't well I'm sorry. What's the what's the next one? <laughs> I <laughs> iron. That is the fourth letter. What is that? What does that mean? I. That's I. And it's like to see like a man's eye, being able to see something, being able to perceive something, right? All right, so that's one word. That's just three. And then the a lot of words you'll note in Hebrew are compounds. There are words put together, smaller words put together to make words and the meanings of those words. So the first part of that word is Yesri, and then the last part is L, which is what two letters make L? Aleph, Lamed. So Aleph meaning what? Oxhead or the strength or the leader, right? The leader, the head. And then the, oh, there's no Lamed up here in that particular word, but What's the last one, Lamed? What is that? Staff or teacher, right? Staff or teacher. And so now let's put this together. Let's put this together, the first part of Yisri. Yisri, meaning the hand on the plow, man, seeing. So you seeing. You, your, your, your hand is on a plow, and you're able to see. It's important to see as you sow, right? It's important to see as you sow. But note that these things are the letters that are um, leaned toward man, mankind, us. So this is of our strength, of our doing. And so now what then do we come in at the end? L. So now this is not just, it is almost like we do stuff, right? And we can mess it up. But then the Most High can come and take that same junk that we just produce and create a beautiful outcome. So L sows. This is man doing all the work. This is man's hand being put to the plow by his own understanding and his own vision. This is by his own understanding and his own vision that he is doing what it is that he's doing. And this is why he found himself where? Dispersed. Sent away. Divorced. Because how did he come up with with? Yarab Am, how did he come up with the eighth day, the eighth month? It was just in his heart. He came up with it from in his heart. By our own strength, by our own way, we will do things, and we will sow and trying to create a harvest. But when the Most High does and comes in, and now he is allowed that. What's going to happen here? What happens in verse, in verse, the beginning of verse 11? Yehuda and Israel come back together, right? And when they come back together, there creates now, if you have sown, if you have sown, Israel being sent to the nations, being sent everywhere, and we have not gotten all the way there yet, but I will give you this. We're going, I'm going to give you a little bit of jump ahead, and then I'm going to pause. The little bit of jump ahead is that by 722, the northern kingdom goes into captivity. They go under Assyrian rulership. 
And when they go under Assyrian, by the, when the Assyrians come in and take them over, they don't just put them to work. They don't just put them to work. What did they do? They scattered them. They sold them everywhere. They sent them everywhere. So much so, where even to this day, those tribes are not easily identifiable. Why are they not? Because they were sowed. They were sent out, and they began to take on the cultures. They began to look like the nations. They began to do like the nations, worship like the nations. But the Most High, when he sows, y'all, y'all ever, like, work so hard at something, let's say, like, getting something to grow? I mean, you know, maybe a plant, or maybe it's some fruit, or maybe it's some vegetables, or whatever it is, flowers, planted, whatever. You work so hard to get that to grow, and you did nothing to get the weeds to grow. And they are everywhere. <laughs> you having to go to the, if you're growing vegetables, you got to go to the vegetables to try to pick them out to get rid of the roots. You know, you if you're sowing grass and trying to get your grass to grow, you ain't put the weeds down there, but they everywhere, right? When the Most High plants something, when he sows something, It doesn't matter how far it goes. It doesn't matter how much it gets covered up. It doesn't matter what happens. That DNA speaks. That DNA speaks. And you're here because your DNA is speaking. At some point, that DNA spoke and it it cried out. It cried out. Where did they come from? It says here, let's, let's, let's read the rest of this verse. Let's read the rest of this verse. And I'm going to close out here. I'm sorry, y'all. Where did they come out of? In verse 11, they came up out of the earth. They came up out of the earth. Everywhere. For great is the day of Yisrael. You've done your part, man. But then Elohim comes. And he allows now that thing. This thing that you meant for my bad is what Yosef said. This thing that was meant for my bad has now been turned to save a great many of people. Hallelujah. So we will see now the beginning of this process we've identified. We're in the middle now of this going away and division. And we're going to see now we have already gotten a preview of what it looks like coming back together. All right. So we're going to we're going to pause there. Let me make sure I put a little thing here so I know where I stopped. All right, praise the most high. Can we give Yahweh praise? Hallelujah. (laughs) Hallelujah.